Well, it's noon here in Lagos, Nigeria. Hello and welcome to Lunchtime Politics. I'm Kayode Okikulu. First, the headlines. Nigeria presents national statement at the ongoing United Nations General Assembly with a call for global leaders to prioritize debt forgiveness and a permanent seat for Nigeria and other African nations at the UN Security Council. begin at the courts and it's yet well another chapter in the EFCC versus Yaya Belo saga. At this time, Justice Emeka Witte of the Federal High Court Abuja has adjourned the alleged money laundering case filed by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission EFCC against the immediate past governor of Kogi State, Mr. Yaya Belo, until October the 30th. The adjournment came as ex-governor Belo moved to the Supreme Court to file an appeal seeking to set aside the arrest warrant issued by the trial court on April the 17th. At the day's proceedings, counsel to Mr. Bello, Sir A. Madoi, drew the court's attention to the fact that the issue of arraignment of a defendant was the subject matter of an appeal already entered by him at the Supreme Court. He said he would like to draw the court's attention to uh, the appeal by virtue of the affidavit of record filed on September the 23rd. He had said the appropriate thing to do was to wait for the decision of the Supreme Court in the appeal before taking any step for arraignment so as not to render the appellant's appeal null or to pull the rug out of the feet of the Supreme Court. And counsel for the FCC and Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Kemi Pinero, however, told the court that the defendant's counsels were turning the court into a place for entertainment. He added that an appeal that the defendant filed at the Court of Appeal disputing the mode of service of the charge and the proof of evidence of their counsel was dismissed by the Court of Appeal on August the 28th. The former governor had appeared within the premises of the EFCC last Wednesday, accompanied by the governor of Kogi State, Usman Odudu, but was not interrogated or detained by the commission. Well, clearly this is a developing story and we'll bring you more updates as they come in. Outside the country now, Nigeria has called on world leaders to recommit themselves to multilateralism by deepening relations among member states of the United Nations in line with the principles of inclusivity, equality and cooperation. Vice President Kashim Shatima made the call while addressing world leaders during the general debate of the ongoing 79th session of the United Nations General Assembly at the UN headquarters in New York, United States. Our State House correspondent, Larry Lassisi, reports. World leaders gather for the opening ceremony of the general debate of the 79th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York, United States. Starting off the speeches, the Secretary General of the United Nations warned nations to draw back from the impunity, inequality and uncertainty which is creating an unsustainable world. Let's move our world towards less impunity and more accountability less inequality and more justice, less uncertainty and more opportunity. The people of the world are looking to us and succeeding generations will look back on us. Let them find us on the side of the United Nations Charter, on the side of our shared values and principles and on the right side of history. Appearing for the final time, the President of the United States stressed his optimism that world leaders can succeed in charting a new future despite the present grim outlook. I know there is a, w a way forward. In 1919, the Irish poet William Butler Yeats described the world, and I quote, where things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, end of quote. Some may say those words describe the world not just in 1919, but in 2024. But I see a, crit a critical distinction. Representing President Bola Tinubu at the event, Vice President Kashim Shetima delivered Nigeria's message to the leaders gathered. He noted that it is clear that more needs to be done to reverse the realities facing the world today. 
Today, these pillars of our organization are threatened. They risk being broken by the relentless pursuit of individual national priorities rather than the collective needs of the nations that are assembled here today. While commitment to multilateralism offers us the surest guarantee of global action to address the existential challenges we face, singularity and nationalism are undermining the aspirations towards the peaceful and collective resolution of such challenges. He also called for a collaboration that revives confidence in democratic rule and international cooperation. The continued manifestations of these challenges testify to our failings rather than to any lofty achievements on our part. Billions of dollars have been committed to the prosecution of wars and the planning of the embers of conflict. Yet, we always recoil from bringing out the resources we need to build peace and to deliver life's necessities to people. The question of governance is at the heart of our problems and also the solution to them. The Vice President also restated the call for a permanent seat for Africa on the UN Security Council and also asked for debt forgiveness for developing countries. The general debate is to continue on Wednesday. From New York, Lanre Lassesi, Channels Television News. Back home, former President Goodluck Jonathan is advocating for peaceful political practices in Nigeria's efforts at good governance. He adds that the battle of politics in Nigeria has become a major security issue and that leadership is not worth the blood of any Nigerian. He stated this during a stakeholders' dialogue in Abuja to commemorate the International Day of Peace. The International Day of Peace is celebrated annually on September 21 to amplify the voices of peace and unity across the world. <laughs> Former President Goodluck Jonathan leads the list of dignitaries attending the dialogue and calls for deliberate efforts to secure sustainable peace in Nigeria. As a country, if we don't change, we politicians don't change our political behavior, and embrace that culture that was embedded in us, that it will look as if it's a part of our genetic makeup. One day this country will then call, uh, uh, to go into a conflagration that nobody can control. So we the politicians must know that what we do wrongly is wrong. And when we politicians justify evil things and say it is politics, this year's celebration with a theme, Cultivating a Culture of Peace, highlights the necessity of fostering dialogue, unity and reconciliation across communities worldwide. And the Director General of the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution highlights that in his presentation. Peace is one intangible thing that people oftentimes um, don't play, they don't recognize it, they don't um, appropriate for it. Um, and I use the word that peace is a marginalized, um, is a marginalized subject. I use the word also that peace is an orphan. People enjoy it, but they don't know that they need to invest in it. His position is echoed by a federal lawmaker who calls for leaders to adopt integrity in the country's development. Injury to one is an injury to all. And whosoever sponsors crisis as a leader, for whatever reason, you are part or you fund or, or advise people to go into crisis, remember the Bible says, and even the Quran says so, whatsoever a man sweat, the same he shall reap. The Institute calls for increased collaboration to address the underlying causes of conflict, such as poverty, unemployment, and socio-political marginalization. To all the stories now, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission's chairman, Mr. Olao Lukwede, has ordered immediate investigation into alleged bribery uh, reports against uh, some of the officers of the commission by Idris Okunaye, also known as Bob Risky, in a viral video circulating across the country, uh, which has been uh, attributed uh, to Bob Risky. A statement issued by the agency's head media and publicity, Mr. Dilo Iwali, premised the investigation 
on a viral clip in which they said that Idris Okone had alleged that some unnamed officers of the EFCC collected 15 million naira from him to drop money laundering charges against him. The clip, which was posted by Martins Vincent Ose, also known as Very Dark Man. But in a swift reaction, the FCC's boss has constituted a team of investigators to look into the allegations, he says. And to this end, the commission has invited both Idris Okone and uh, Ose, uh, that's a very black, uh, very dark man, uh, to make themselves available at its Lagos directorate to assist investigators on earth the alleged bribery. We'll take a moment now on the show, and when we return... Or the, EF, the APC, rather, has been speaking on the Observer Bishop's report about the Edo State election. They're not taking it, and we speak with one of the Observer Missions on the show this afternoon. Just stay with us. Welcome back. President Bola Tinubu has declined assent to a bill seeking to extend the tenure of service of legislative officers at the National Assembly as well as the 36 state houses of assembly from 35 to 40 years and other retirement and their retirement age from 60 to 65 years. Well, President Tinubu declined assent and that was conveyed in a letter read on the floor of the upper legislative chamber by the President of the Senate, Godzilla Pabio. The harmonized retirement age bill was first stepped down in February this year for further research and consultation with stakeholders after a significant number of senators voted against it. Our National Assembly correspondent, Gloria Mizoke, reports. <laughs> After eight weeks of recess, lawmakers resume legislative sitting led by the president of the Senate, Senator Godswell Lapabio. The Senate president launches into the various correspondences from the presidency. Appointment of Chief Justice of Nigeria. I have the honor to forward the nomination of Honorable Justice Kudirad Motomori Olatokumba Kekerekum, C.O.N. For well, confirmation as Chief Justice of Nigeria. Senator Apapio well, also announced President Tinubu's refusal to assent to the retirement age bill. In respect of the harmonized retirement age for the legislative officers of the National Assembly of the Federal Republic of Nigeria bill passed by the National Assembly and forwarded to me for assent. Upon thorough examination and careful consideration, I have decided to withhold my assent to the bill. This decision is made in accordance with the powers vested in me by the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The bill, which sought to extend the service years of hundreds of workers who were due to exit the legislative system from 2024, was introduced under the Eighth Assembly and has consistently hit the rocks before the current decline. A minute silence is then held in honor of the late Senator Ifani Uba. Rest peace. In a welcome address, the president of the Senate vowed to focus on the challenge of security while reassuring Nigerians of the Senate's swift response to the current economic hardship. We want Nigerians to know that their struggles are not lost on this Senate. Our sacred duty as your NS representatives remain to respond with the urgency and compassion that the current situation Deserve. We must, as senators, prioritize the issues of security of our great nation, ensuring that every citizen can walk down any street in this country without fear. The Senate has adjourned its legislative sitting on the first day of plenary before the stipulated time to mourn a former colleague, Senator Ifani Ubahu, passed late July. On Wednesday, when they reconvene, the lawmakers will consider, among other things, for confirmation, the appointment of Justice Kudirat Kekireku as the Chief Justice of Nigeria. From the National Assembly, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. 
Well, let's now bring you more on the aftermath of the Edo governorship election. Yes, it's been days after that election. A winner has been called, but the dust is yet to settle. Yesterday, the All Progressives Congress, whose candidate, Senator Mondio Pueblo, won uh, that election, uh, put out a statement targeted uh, at one of the lead civil society organizations monitoring uh, the election, which gave out a report at Siaga, Africa. And in that particular statement, the APC asked election observer missions uh, not to usurp uh, the role of INEC and, and not to uh, act as though they're election management agencies. And uh, you know, this was the outcome of a lot of work and monitoring done by uh, this election observer mission. So let's speak with uh, Mr. James Ugochuku, who is executive director of Aid Africa, uh, co-convener of Nigeria Civil Society Situation Room. Uh, Mr. Oguchuku, uh, you're welcome to Lunchline Politics. I know you must have seen that statement uh, by the APC, uh, and I imagine that you have uh, some reactions to it, particularly as it uh, touches on your work, uh, the civil society organizations monitoring that election and eventual you know, reports that were put out. Good afternoon, Kayode. Um, James Ugochuku, uh, Executive Director, Alliance for Inclusive Development. I uh, was former co convener of uh, Nigeria Civil so Society situation and not uh, anymore. So now, uh, to answer your question, uh, when I saw the statement, I was just uh, surprised, you know, because uh, I don't understand why government should not, first of all, establish an uh, uh, a, a committee of inquiry into the the activities of all the stakeholders in a do election, just like uh, Yara Udua did when uh, he came to power. He set up a waste report to review the 20, 2007 election. So if there are this kind of allegation, I think what the government should do, instead of seeing Yaga Africa as their enemy, is to make an inquest into what happened, independent inquest into what happened in Edo. Because uh, Election observation uh, is uh, an international approved uh, best practice or exercise when it comes to election. That is why during election, general election, you see different observer groups from the European Union, from uh, uh, China, from West Africa, from AU coming. And what do they come to do? They are setting integrity tests that election should be subjected to. And if it's not adhering to that, the job of the observers is to point it out. So nobody is uh, attacking government or anything. We are just critic critiquing the process to ensure that uh, it meets all these integrity tests and, of course, uh, recom make recommendation. They're talking about recommendation. The Electoral Act we have today, most of the electoral reforms we have today, the BVAS, the IRF, and all those things we are using as a result of technical support that civil society has been giving to INEC and other stakeholders, including the Senate that we just talked about now. Civil society, take them on recess, take them on retreat, discussing this, uh, how to improve our electoral process. And of course, uh, most of this technology you see, there are a lot of uh, recommendations that uh, civil society have made towards that. And of course, that is why we are seeing it here. So the government should not uh, be seeing observers as their enemy, but uh, partners working in progress for our election reform and uh, democratic development. Uh, and in that statement uh, by the APC's uh, spokesperson, that's the National Publicity Secretary, uh, Mr. Felix uh, Moka, he particularly said that um, the election outcome is uh, unequivocal rejection of the other party, asking the CSO to refrain from enlisting itself uh, in the season's uh, annals of infamy, uh, calling it political and all of that. So there's a clear job uh, that um, civil society organizations have to do in monitoring elections, being a watchdog uh, in a democracy. And there's also uh, the work of uh, INEC, that's the election management body. For the APC, uh, they believe that the work of a CSO is crossing the line by the, by, by the fact of giving a verdict, uh, saying that it failed the integrity test. So you know the laws, the electoral laws, you know what INEC can do, what the uh, missions can do, did the CSO go out of its way in any sense uh, by giving a verdict of that election saying it failed integrity test? There are two things here, and uh, we should actually look at the intent of the statement of uh, the person that issued that. It's trying to rope, <coughs> excuse me, it's trying to rope a uh, civil society into 
being at loggerhead with INEC, which is not actually what happened. Mm. Trying to make it look as if uh, the civil society announced uh, a different uh, candidate or release a particular result uh, to say uh, they are the one that conducted the election. I think the answer to all uh, this thing is untrue. Uh, the civil society simply critique each and every single activity or procedure of uh, INEC during the election. And they say that it failed the integrity test because the Electoral Act 2022 and INEC guideline uh, that has been amended and reviewed several times has a procedure that need to be adhered to. And a situation where we, the civil society that even supported them in drafting all those uh, uh, documents are seeing that they are going against it. I think uh, uh, it will be foolish of us not to speak up, and that is what we have already done. The mm -hmm. parallel voter tabulation that they are doing, uh, which Yaga is doing, has been there right from time and is being practiced in several countries. The idea behind that is to say, okay, let us have a statistical analysis of all the events that happen on the election day, all the procedure, let us document it, including the tabulation of results, because the electoral had made it very clear that election results should be posted in each and each, each and every polling unit. And right. we work as a network, we gather all this result and we can say, okay, yes, this is the tally. Right. So our ask uh, uh, is not to announce it. Indeed. And, that and, is, uh, and none, uh, of the, none of the civil society organizations did that. On a final note, Mr. Ogochuku, how then do we protect uh, you know, civil society organizations, because uh, they're vital to democracy. Uh, we don't want to see any threat, uh, you know, maybe trying to stifle their voices, uh, trying to paint a target on their backs. That's clearly not what we want to see. So uh, in about 30 seconds, how do we ensure protection uh, for the civil society organizations in, uh, you know, pursuit of their job or their work, I should say? Section 40 is section 2. B of 1999 constitution as amended said that sovereignty belongs to the people from whom the government through this constitution derives its authority. So the people in authority are working for the people and for the civil society which present the voice of the people. So whether they like it or not, power is transient. One day they'll come back to the society that we are trying to protect. So whoever is writing or solicited a statement on behalf of the government, she will refrain from uh, uh, roping civil society into politics. We are not political and we are not supporting anybody. But right. if the government in power goes against its own guideline as contained in the Electoral 2022, 1999 Constitution and other stand law, we will not fail to call them out no matter the level of intimidation. Well, Mr. Ogotchuku. Well said. We have to anchor at this point. We'll be speaking with Mr. James Oguchuku, who is the ED of Aid Africa and former co-convener of the Nigeria Civil Society Situation Room. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Well, there you have it. You've been served. That's lunchtime politics for this afternoon. Thank you for watching. I'm Kayadoki Kyodu. Goodbye. <laughs>